Good morning. Good morning. Happy Friday, everybody. It's Friday. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> this is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Today is going to be a very profound message that we'll be bringing to you. We're going to be studying in Revelation chapter 6 on the seven seals. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's the wrong one. I meant the seven seals. <laughs> he's having fun with you now. For those of you who are only <coughs> listening to the audio, he showed a picture of seven seals in the ocean. And then seals... Um, what are they? Navy SEALs. So we're going to have a fun day. Uh, all is well. And what was so great about the picture of the SEALs uh, on the, in the water, there were seven of them. It was a whole group of SEALs, exactly. but seven of them were looking at the camera. Right. It's prophetic. Anything that makes you do a double take, pray to interpret. <laughs> you know, we love you yes. when uh, my, my quirky sense of humor comes out. We love it. God gave us our sense of humor. Amen. But after going from Genesis uh, throughout the Bible now for several years, we've come to Revelation chapter 6, and we actually will be studying on the seven seals. You'll never forget that. <laughs> Every time somebody reads that chapter, they're going to think about the seven seals. Remember what Prophet Russ said? <laughs> now today... Today, you should have gotten your Giving Day email Amen. about breaking the stronghold of Pharaoh over your life. It's a new month, uh, first Friday of the month, when we bring out a new download that we give to you. It's a PDF download that you can get on social media. If you're subscribed to the Daily Prophetic Word, you will get it in your inbox, and uh, because... We This is not a, a PDF that we've distributed before. It's about dealing with debt. Now, where does that come from? When we're dealing with debt, you know, the Israelites, or the Jews in Jesus' day, they were under the jackboot of Roman occupation. But they got mad because Jesus... Um, suggested that they were in bondage. They say, we've never been in bondage to any man. Well, did they forget Egypt? Were they just ignoring the Roman soldiers with swords drawn uh, around them? Of course they were in bondage. Likewise, people today, well, I'm not a slave. Well, if you think indentured servitude doesn't exist today, just try to make payments, mm -hmm. your payments, like your house note, without a job. Whenever, you know, when they say consumer confidence is low, they say that is because you are putting money in savings. You know, people in the economy are putting money in savings. And Wall Street says, oh, consumer confidence is low. And you know what they do? They start lowering interest rates that are earned in savings. And they start laying people off. Right. Say, oh, you're trying to get financially free? Well, try to make, we're going to make you make payments without jobs, which forces you to go into your savings. If you don't have anything laid back for your children, for your retirement. Mm -hmm. And that is the spirit of Pharaoh. When pe my people want to get free, the Lord says, Pharaoh then comes out and says, well, you've been making payments. Let's make payments without jobs. Just like Pharaoh said, make bricks without straw. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And so the, the PDF that we have for you is about being delivered out of the domain of darkness and what that implies in your life. The, the idea of a domain can be translated or construed to be you're coming out of the economy of darkness into the economy of the kingdom. And this PDF that we have for you, you can get it on social media, uh, on Father's Heart Ministry page and eChurch, on my personal profile. Uh, we'll have it up on the website by the end of the day. Uh, it will reveal to you how to break the spirit of Pharaoh that doesn't want you to be financially free. This message will show you how to access the currency of the kingdom and walk in unlimited supply. Amen. It's something that we, we started experiencing 10 years ago and we want to see you have your version Amen. of our Amen. 
breakthrough. We want to see you. This PDF, this message will help you walk into what others are waiting for. They're just waiting for some random thing to happen. Oh, no. You can walk into, just like Enoch walked into his immortality, you can walk out of debt by supernatural grace into the economy of the kingdom where money moves by the Spirit and makes a radical difference in your life. Get the download. It's going to bless you. Now, that's our first priority in giving day, to give something to you. Of course, we do it every single day, but you know what I'm saying. (laughs) Uh, Then we want to open a revelatory portal to bring financial increase and blessing in your life. We learned that from Kim Clement. Clement. Mm -hmm. The imperative of giving into the anointing. It was a powerful principle in Kim's life and ministry, and we follow that example. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for a miracle? Here's what, all giving has to be in a revelatory atmosphere. Look, this, that's what cracks open the heavens, delivers you from the clutches of the economy of man, and gives you an opportunity to be uh, ejected into the economy of the kingdom. And that, uh, I don't know the chapter and verse, but in Isaiah, the scripture that says, um, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. What yoke? If there's a bondage uh, in finances or in health, whatever bondage is is there, the anointing is what breaks the yoke. And that anointing is where we like people to give into the anointing and it'll break off yokes of all kinds. By whatever means you engage with the anointing, it produces breakthrough in that area. The anointing breaks the yoke of what? The yoke of debt. The yoke of financial bondage. Where's what? Here's the revelatory bullet. Are you ready for the bullet? <laughs> this is the one. Get ready. Get ready to go to propheticnow.com and sow yeah. your seed. Yeah. I was pondering giving day this week and I was laying in my bed in the middle of the night and the Lord woke me up and he said this to me. Miracle seeds meet miracle needs. Amen. Are you hearing that? Mm-hmm. Somebody else might have said that. Uh, it's not that obscure, you know, people like to make those things rhyme, but I got it from the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. A miracle seed. Do you need a miracle? Do you have a need that can only be met by a miracle? Miracle seeds produce miracle needs. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity. The widow in 1 Kings was about to starve along with her son. There was no hope. They were in the vice grip of terror and disaster, and a prophet showed up looking for an offering. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I could bring people out of that reaction they get from that because of the curse and the vow of poverty that's contaminated the Christian's thinking about finances. Listen, in Revelation 4, the declaration over the Lamb was that he was worthy to receive glory, honor, and riches. He doesn't need riches, but he condescended to receive riches so that he then could impart them to you and I by covenantal right, because by the covenant of Calvary, he can't hold and won't hold anything back from you. No. So he condescended. He, he doesn't need riches. Everything he thinks comes to pass. Amen. So he received, yes, I'll receive for you. How do we get you there? By engaging in the anointing that produces it. And this is exactly what Elijah did in 1 Kings 17, 13. He told her, he said, don't be afraid. Stop fearing. Fear breeds offense and offense holds you in captivity. Amen. Go and go ahead and make, okay, take care of your needs, man. You got to get your ox out of the ditch, but make me a little cake first. Give me something first. Why? Because Philippians 4, 19 says that, My God will meet all of your need according to his riches and glory. And Paul was talking about people partnering with his ministry. Go read it and you'll see that so. And then he gave her a prophecy. How many want to receive a prophecy? Yes, I want a prophecy. He said, give me a little cake first. Yes, he did. Listen, give into the anointing. And here is the prophecy over life. For thus saith the Lord, the barrel of meal, your paycheck, your checkbook, your financial reserves will not waste, will not decline. How about coming into a place where you don't ever have to check your checkbook balance? Are you ready? Jesus. (laughs) Amen. 
for it's not going to waste, neither will the cruise of oil, your checkbook, your savings, your stock portfolio, your financial needs, your position in your job. It's not going to fail. It'll always be there for you. Until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. Amen. It's a prophecy over her life. It's a prophecy over the life of everyone that engages with this word. To plant a miracle seed. What's a miracle seed? It's the one that makes you lay awake at night. And says, I sure hope that's God. Because if it's not, I'm in trouble. I can't tell you how many yeah. times we've given uh, uh, offerings that made our hands cl clammy. Made my, my heart kind of, <laughs> hmm. Hello, <laughs> help us, Jesus. <laughs> and and then, in just a matter of weeks, in just a matter of months, a financial detonation. And it's, oh, you're a preacher. That's how it works for you. No, I Amen. learned this in over 15 years in business. Amen. When I saw my personal economy enlarged by over 800% on two different occasions. Amen. Because I learned how to walk in the economy of the kingdom. I learned how to make the man of God a cake first. I learned how to give into the anointing. That, that verse, I get it. It, it. it offends the religious mentality. Because many are so bound by the spirit of Pharaoh, they're listening to Pharaoh instead of listening to Moses. I am your Moses. I am your financial Moses today. Amen. Are you listening? Amen. This woman could have taken the prophet's declaration as an affront to her need. If you're saying I need to give you an offering, then my offense knows no bounds. Nothing changes then. I want to see you get your version of our breakthrough in this area of your life. But instead, she acted. She obeyed. God bless her. What a woman. She sure did. She was a you-go girl for God. Mm -hmm. Jesus talked about her. He says, there's a whole lot of widows in Israel that were starving to death when this woman got her breakthrough. What's the difference? Them widows in Israel that should have known better were counting their pennies and getting mad at the preacher because he was uh, trying to get them into faith. And this little woman said, hey, uh, I'll take mine now. How about you? <laughs> Come on. So are you ready to enter into the economy of the kingdom. Go to propheticnow.com. Do it now in the anointing. I don't care if you're in eight lanes of traffic. You get <laughs> off the, the next exit. You pull your phone out. You go to propheticnow.com. Do it in the anointing because when you give into the anointing, money begins to move by the Spirit in your life. Amen. Are you listening? And remember, your response to God is a metric of His response to you. And I'm God's representative. Remember what He told Sam? He said, they haven't done it unto you. They've done it unto me. Listen, don't reject me. Don't decline. This is a mandate from God because your response to this overture is indexed to a response that God takes personally. Amen. Please hear me. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> I know a lot of you get it. A lot of you are like, Arch! Yes, you know what I mean? You stop can, the car. You just stop four lanes of traffic backed up on the LA freeway because you get how this works. Amen. The anointing breaks the yoke. Go to propheticnow.com. <laughs> Clip on the donation link. You can give by PayPal. You can give by Square if you don't want to have a PayPal account. There is a mailing address. It's, write that check. Write it now. You're going down. You got, if you're right handed, you're going down. You got the checkbook out on the console. You're writing that check. Are you listening? Mm hmm. Not while they're driving. <laughs> oh, go ahead. No, because... Look, you know, you're putting on your makeup when you're going down the road. You're eating a, a protein bar. You're talking on the phone and checking something. You know you do it. <laughs> or you can call 417. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Hands free. 417-593-9802. <laughs> Amen. Call Katie. Yes. Katie, sweet Katie, we get more feedback. We get she's people a, that call to give. She's a peach. They call to give to our ministry, and they immediately follow up with an email and say, you better treat Katie right, because if you don't, I'm going to hire her away from you. In fact, I'm going to offer her a job anyway. She's so sweet. Mm -hmm. And she's sitting there right now just looking at her phone. She's wondering why you don't call. <laughs> Pick up the phone, call her, put her on speed dial. Amen. I know, I just, we talked to a, a gentleman at the conference in Sterling, Virginia. And that's exactly what he does. People come up to us all the time. Call 417-593-9802 and give the net break and catch donation. Give the one that makes money move by the Spirit. Give the miracle seed because the miracle seed that you give will meet a miracle need. Amen. Father's Heart Ministry, P.O. Box 1915, Branson, Missouri, 65615. 
And all that information is on propheticnow.com. Memorize that URL and you can go back there later on. Say, Russ, much learning hath made thee mad. Why does he have to get all excited like that? Because we see it work in our lives. That's we see why. it working in our lives. We're just trying to impart it. We want to see you get your version Amen. of our breakthrough. Amen. Trying to help you. Mm-hmm. I have a vision to raise up a tribe of people who get this. Amen. I want a thousand people like us Amen. who've experienced what we've experienced because they've done what we've done. Amen. And we'll move uh, we'll move the benchmark of the kingdom of God into the territory of the enemy to shift culture for the kingdom. Yes, Jesus. Is that you? And the ecclesia, 6,000. <laughs> Don't just say yes. Mm-hmm. Plant your miracle seed. Say yes, Russ. We're, mm-hmm. we're behind you. We're going to partner with you to see it happen. And then testify of what God does for you. Amen. So today... Revelation chapter 6, the, the opening of the seven seals. <laughs> when John sees the first six of the seven seals opening in this verse, does that have anything to do with us personally? I mean, people really go off the rails on this stuff. What does this mean, what we're going to read today, in terms of the scope of future events, and what does it mean for us personally? Today we will gain in-depth understanding as to this chapter's relevance to our personal lives and to the world around us. And Ken, if you begin by reading the entire chapter, Revelations chapter 6. Moving right along in Revelations. Verse 1, And I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great reward, a great sword, rather. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of the heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of the wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together, when it's rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So, Revelation chapter 6. John sees the lamb that was introduced in chapter 5 opening the first seal of a total of seven seals 
that are affixed to a book that has been Very retrieved. Good and yep. a prophet she showed up. You want to get an offering. <laughs> Let's see. Did you get it? I hope so. Continue, please, sir. Forgive me. Help you. I have to help my wife. This is part of I'm my job. I'm technically challenged. Go ahead and open that up. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for being so patient. She wants to watch your Break comments. It. I want to see the comments, and I can't do it without this. So I just need to put the volume. Here we go. We I go. muted it. Sorry, guys. We're learning how to do this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So let's start over again. Revelation chapter 6. John sees... The lamb that was introduced in chapter 5, opening the first seal of a total of seven seals on a book retrieved from the hand of the Father on the throne. Now, when this seal is opened, the four beasts respond. Mm -hmm. They turn in unison to John and say, come and see. What can we learn from this? Now, I want you to remember what we touched on in chapter 4 and in chapter 5. This not only has something to do with God's linear purpose through time, it has something to do with some, what's going on on the inside of you. That Another way to put that is, as is the macrocosm, so is the microcosm. Mm -hmm. The word of God is like a hologram or a fractal. The smallest component of those quantum artifacts, quantum theorists and physicists tell us, the smallest component of these artifacts is a replica of the cosmic phenomena. Uh, then the Bible agrees with that. It says that God put eternity in our hearts. So this is a scientific fact and it's a spiritual reality. What am I saying? If Jesus sits on the throne over the cosmos, the macrocosm, what they call them, the field of all possibilities, then he likewise sits on the throne over your heart. Mm -hmm. The microcosm or the micro field of energy. Hmm. We showed this at length in our teaching in chapter 4 and in chapter 5. So, I'll ask you, I'm just want to ask you an inductive question to make this point. Is the Lamb enthroned in your heart? Amen. Yes, he is. Yes. Paul declared as much in Ephesians 3.17. I've spent a lot of time studying that whole concept of Christ enthroned in our heart. Look what it says. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. So that you could be rooted and grounded in love. Now, if Christ is in you, is he a king? And kings sit on thrones, so he's enthroned in your heart. Now, what is he doing? He's opening things up to you. That's what the lamb did. The lamb's on the throne in the macrocosm, and he was opening things up to John. He's on the throne in our heart in microcosm. And he's opening things up to us. Mm -hmm. What is he opening? He's opening doors. Amen. He's opening the heavens. He's opening the seals on the book of your life that Moses referred to in Exodus 32, 32. Now, how do we know that's happening? When, when the seals were opened, the four, li four living creatures responded in the environment of the macrocosm. And so, what are the four living creatures on the inside of you? They are a type and shadow of the four chambers of your heart. 24 ribs encasing your heart. Jesus mm -hmm. enthroned in your heart. Mm -hmm. 24 ribs of the 24 elders. The four living beasts are the four chambers of your heart. And it's God talking to you on the inside. Come and see. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel God moving on your heart? Oh, yeah. Do you feel <laughs> differently under the anointing than you do at other times? Mm -hmm. That's the four living creatures on the inside of you saying, come and see. Why? Because the Lamb's opening something up to you. Come on. See, the sense of God's presence and the fire of God that you feel, mind-body medicine will tell you that this is what they call the emotional body mm -hmm. responding to the voice of God, resonating not from without, low, don't go out, don't, they'll say low here, low there. No, 
responding from within, seeking, resonating in the acoustics of your inner man, seeking to turn you toward God, sitting upon the throne that you might see the Lamb on the throne of your heart in microcosm, even as John turned and saw the Lamb seated on the throne in macrocosm. The throne of God in the heavens. Mm -hmm. So, when John turns, see, What's the message of prophet? Repent. Turn! If you turn, you see the Lamb, and stuff starts happening. Yes, Lord. <laughs> when John turns, there's a thunderous release of visionary dimensions that comes up before him like a scroll. Things start opening up. Thank you, Lord. The first seal is opened, and then the successive seals follow through the next few chapters. Let's talk about the seals in turn, then we'll shift the narrative. The first seal reveals... Or, 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 just kidding. I, I can't <laughs> let it go. Forgive me. The first seal reveals a horse and a rider with a bow on it and a crown that was given to him. In other words, authority to move. Right. Now, this is a vision with implications for the distant future, but it also brought recognition, instant recognition in John's mind to something he would have been very familiar with. In other words, he saw it, he would have instantly recognized that and put a name to it that we're not familiar with. Mm -hmm. Let me help you understand it and we'll tell you what John would have been thinking of, instantly would have thought of. If you see a picture of a soldier coming out of the water with scuba gear and a submachine gun, like the picture we, we had fun with this morning, if you see a picture like this, what do you think of? Your mind instantly goes... To Navy SEALs, because they are the only warriors who conduct warfare in that way. Mm. Well, when John sees the rider on the white horse, mm -hmm. and the, remember the rider has a bow, mm -hmm. he would have immediately thought of an army of horse-mounted archers that were a household name. Mm -hmm. In the ancient world. These were called the Parthians. Right. Now, the Parthians, in other words, when the first seal was opened, John saw a Parthian jump out of that, doing what he was known to do. He was a very successful mounted archer. There was no other army, not Hannibal's army, not the army of the Romans, not Alexander's army. They never excelled in horse-mounted archery. So the Parthians, and also the Parthians were ancient guerrilla fighters. And they were the only, listen, why are they important? Because they were the only military force that the Romans had no defense against. The armies of Rome were terrified of the Parthians. Yeah. The Parthians, when Roman children were naughty, their mama would say, you better be good or the Parthians are going to get you. Truly they did. When Roman children, this is, no, this is all history. You can discover it if you know your history. Roman children would go to bed and they would look under their beds for the Parthians before they went to sleep. They feared these people. Like some used to tell their kids the boogeyman. The tie tie. Sad. Right, Nanette? <laughs> Nanette Terrebonne. She knows what the tie tie is. Or is not. <laughs> <laughs> the Parthian soldiers, here's what they would do. Mounted archer, archers. Now, you remember the Roman soldiers would gather in a phalanx, like a wall of interlocking shields. Mm -hmm. And they would have rank upon rank upon rank of them. Even if you broke through the first one, the next one was there. The Parthian soldiers would charge the Romans. They wouldn't run from them. They would charge the Romans in these locked formations the Romans are shield to shield, and the Parthians would charge straight at them like a car going at a wall uh, at full force. They would charge straight at the Romans, and on their ponies, their ponies would leap over the first rank of Roman soldiers, and they would turn around, and the rider would instantly fire an arrow into the unprotected back of the soldier underneath wow. him. They would do this, and then they would... Uh, the, the rider behind them would do it with the next rank and the next rank. And so waves of Parthians would just decimate these otherwise impregnable, impregnable Roman forces until the Romans were in disarray fleeing the field of battle. 
the Parthians were the only warriors that did this. And the Romans never defeated them, although Parthia, the ancient lands of Parthia, were in their backyard. So, where were? When you understand where the Parthians were, where their lands were, you find out who they are. The Parthian lands, where they lived, is today modern-day Iran. In verse 3, when the second seal is open, a red horse... Well, let's talk a little bit about Iran. Terrorism, for all the technology of modern-day armies, we've been unable, since the days of the Vietnamese War, to defeat terrorism or guerrilla warfare. We went in with all of our might into Vietnam, and we were unable to defeat them in spite of being having superior numbers, superior technology, and that's been true in every field of conflict since. Why? Because the Viet Cong took something from the playbook of the Parthians in terms of guerrilla warfare, and they found a way to not be defeated. Mm -hmm. And another thing is interesting, they have a bow. And what is a bow? It fires an arrow. Think about an arrow. What's the modern day equivalent of an arrow? I know we have arrows, but I'm talking about in, in the military. The nearest equivalent to the modern, uh, uh, a modern example of an arrow is a missile. Wow. It's a missile. Mm -hmm. And isn't that Iran today? They, they have, the, the, their whole threat is missile technology. Guerrilla warfare, state sponsored terrorism. Mm -hmm. And their, their big thing is missiles. But it's interesting that when they first come out as a threat, they have the, the Parthian, the, the Parthian's picture of this vision is a Parthian with a bow but no arrows. Okay. No arrows are mentioned. He he's on that Parthian pony, he's got a bow, but he doesn't initial initially does not have any arrows. And today we look at Iran, they have missiles, but they don't have warheads. Hmm. Fits exactly yes. on the ancient lands of the right. Parthians. My goodness. So the first horseman talks about Iran. We'll talk awesome. a little more about that in a minute. You don't hear people talking about this stuff like that, honey. No. I know. It's To me, it's so plain. Amen. In verse 3, when the second seal is opened, a rider on a red horse goes out, having power to take peace from the earth because he was given a great sword. Now, that's interesting. So here's another. We've looked at one avenue of conflict. Here's another one. What do swords represent in the Bible? The word. Yeah, instantly, you, re you got that. The word. Hebrews 4 tells us that the word of God is a sword. So we understand that the rider on the red horse takes peace from the earth by virtue of his words or a narrative that mm -hmm. he has been released to bring into the earth that gives him power. Remember the one place in the scripture talks about the Antichrist that it has given to him a mouth speaking great things. Yep. In the ability to cast all the world into chaos and warfare. Now we could give a lot of controversial examples of that in the modern day, but let's go back a little bit. Think about World War II. World War II was instigated through the massive oratorical skill and mesmerism of one man, Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. Hitler was not some isolated figure either in history. Uh, he was not the Antichrist, although they believed back then, they believed he was. Mm -hmm. But he was an Antichrist figure. Because uh, 1 John 4, 1 tells us that there are many of these Antichrist figures that have gone out throughout history, into the world. Now, there were quite a few in ancient times and up through the Middle Ages that could be construed to be an Antichrist and were certainly believed to be the Antichrist in their day. Uh, modern examples, of course, we mentioned Hitler, Mussolini. Mussolini was seen as an Antichrist figure. Woodrow Wilson, huh? Yeah. Woodrow and, and Eleanor? <laughs> Woodrow Wilson might surprise you as an Antichrist character. 
But when he went to France, if you read the personal history of Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, after World War I, when he went to France, he was greeted by the largest crowd gathered in history. Never in history before or since. Over two million people mm. swelled the streets of Paris and they praised Wilson as a messianic figure. They actually praised him in verbiage that is reminiscent of what the Bible says they'll call the Antichrist. They will laud him. And Wilson went on to found the League of Nations, which which was a forerunner Mm -hmm. of globalism today. So we see the threat that the Parthians represent, terrorism. Somebody comes out with a, a, a narrative that doesn't solve the problem, it intensifies the problem. Is that the big thing? Oh, you can't say that because it just creates more problems. Hmm. The narrative that brings chaos. Yeah. And then the third thing that happens, so we have things being said, things being done, and the third narrative is a rider on a black horse with a pair of scales. What happens when we have that kind of... Uh, insecurity in the earth. The The next horse comes out with a pair of scales in his hand and John hears a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. It's talking about economic downturn. Mm-hmm. Have we not had that? Had that? Mm-hmm. It speaks of economic upheaval on a global scale during a time of escalating warfare throughout the earth precipitated by the threat that the Parthians or the Iranians, that aspect of the vision, represents. But notice that don't hurt the oil and the wine. This is exactly describing what happened in the first century church. The, there was insurgency in the Middle East to drive out the Romans. Civil war, chaos, anarchy was coming People were dying. Cities were being destroyed. The Romans were coming back in to correct the problem. It was horrible. But in the midst, and can you imagine, think about what happened uh, on 911 right. financially. Destroyed the, the U.S. economy. Mm. Destroyed people's personal economy. Remember how things got during that time. Yeah. Imagine what it was like in the first century church. But notice that everything's uh, uh, falling apart like a $2 watch in the first century. But the, the command is, don't hurt the wine and don't hurt the oil. They went eating their meat with singleness and gladness of heart. They were joyful. And the apostles were doing great signs and wonders. The oil is the anointing. The wine is the joy. Oh, Christians, what do, what do we do? What do we do? Hmm. We partake of the vintage of heaven that's poured out during those times. We say the skies and falling. The kingdom the is kingdom coming. The kingdom is coming. <laughs> those are times of outpouring of God's spirit. Amen. When the oil is poured out. Amen. When the vintage is available that you've Amen. been longing to drink. Yes. Even though everything seems to be falling apart. That's right. And interestingly enough, during that time, the people of God were out of debt. Not one of them had a financial need. Hallelujah. Do you get a sense of seeing an application of this vision to our day. Iran, as a nation-state sponsor of terrorism, Iran has brought more chaos and financial upheaval, things represented by these horsemen, Mm -hmm. into the modern world than we could suggest. If things were to escalate, the economic cost and the cost in lives of a conventional war with Iran and her Axis allies would bring the world into global economic failure of epic proportions, which is why you hear the pundit saying, we cannot have a conventional war with Iran. It will be destructive beyond all measure. Mm. And they're saying it over and over on both sides of the aisle. Now, does this mean that all the vision that John sees implies is just speaking about this? Is what John sees only applicable to our day? No, that would not be so. Mm. You have to understand the cyclical nature of prophetic fulfillment. James 3, 6 talks about something called the course of nature that the tongue sets on fire. Now that word course means wheel. There's coming out of you a wheel of quantum energy that is controlled by your words that determines what happens in your life. As is the microcosm, so is the macrocosm. Life on the micro level and the macro level is cyclical. Quantum theorists 
who once thought that the cosmos was moving, you know, the universe was moving in a linear fashion away at 360 degrees from the point of the alleged Big Bang. <laughs> They've now discovered that the cosmos is actually curving back on itself to its original point of origin. Amen. As it is in nature, so it is in the realm of the spirit. These prophecies, any prophecy is cyclical in nature through time, whether it is on the world scene or in your life, and until it inevitably comes. It is fulfilled in layers. You get this. I know Camille King gets this, one of our listeners uh, of the audio broadcast, because I've talked to her. She hasn't exactly said that, but I know she understands it mm -hmm. because of her prophetic insight. Yeah. Uh, so it, until it's this layered fulfillment, until it inevitably comes to final fulfillment after many levels and variations of fulfillment on many planes of experience, both personal, mm -hmm. corporate, and worldwide. Wow. So that's, I'm with you. I'm just looking at you because you're so beautiful. Excuse me. You're so when, <laughs> it's all the same. When the fourth <laughs> seal is opened, Death, Clint Eastwood rides out. <laughs> Pale rider. <laughs> no Death rides out accompanied by hell. Is hell a person? Hmm. Power is given to these two beings to bring about a culmination of suffering brought on by the three former riders and what they represent. And at this point, a tipping point of God's cosmic timeline is reached and it's like the soul's that were slain for the word of God, the martyrs in heaven. Right. It's like they can't take it anymore. <laughs> they cry out, how long, O oh Lord? Amen. It's interesting. That's the fifth seal. That's the only thing that happens with the fifth seal. Okay. Five is the number of grace. Mm. All this is happening. What's the father doing? He's frowning with a furled brow upon the chaos of the earth. No, he's not. He's saying, wait a minute. I better check on my saints. Yeah. How you doing, fellas? How long? Yeah. I figured that's what was going on. Oh, <laughs> and the father assuages the chagrin of these saints by promising, hey, j just a little, wait mm -hmm. for it. Just keep swimming. <laughs> Dory. <laughs> yeah. Just a little longer. And then to, to compensate them, to pacify them, uh, to waiting a little longer, clothing is given to them. Lin, linen ephods. This is almost as though to say, yes, yes, I see you're ready. Go ahead and get dressed. It's like the children, mm -hmm. you know, going to school. They can't find their shoes. Going to Disneyland. They're sitting in the car at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> waiting for you to come out. True. So he said, okay, kids, go ahead and get ready. Go ahead and get dressed for what comes next. Mm, now, so what comes next? Well, this may represent, this period may represent the time on earth. Now we see what's happening to those in the heavens. What about the ones on earth? Right. It may represent the time when just as they're putting on their garments in heaven, we're putting on immortality on the earth, our glorified bodies. It's described oh, elsewhere in the scriptures. Yeah, let's have that. In other that. words, the baptism of fire. Come on now. We taught extensively on that. We're not going to do it right now. Amen. So then the sixth seal is opened and an earthquake mm -hmm. takes place. The sixth seal is open and an earthquake commences that precipitates the dimming of the sun. Now, that may very well be a volcanic ejection accompanying the quake. The sun has been dimmed by volcanic explosions before. Sure. This happened when Krakatoa erupted in the 1800s and also around the year 1000, all of medieval Europe experienced darkness mm -hmm. in, and they never explained it. Inexplicable darkness like at noonday, it was like midnight with no moon for three days. It caused this universal panic and total anarchy because they all thought the advent was at hand and the judgment of all things. So we see the progression that we could see a cataclysm. There could be something like Mount St. Helens or worse. You know, God has showed us in our book, um, The Next 50 Years of Prophetic Perspective, that the... Um, Yellowstone caldera is going to erupt. The Yellowstone caldera covers four states mm -hmm. of the United States. And it could very well be that which happens. Right. 
And so we see the progression of these seals, beginning with the Parthian figure under the first seal, which may very well represent the disruptive influence of Iran among the nations, followed by unlimited conventional war, economic upheaval, levels of famine and death coming in the aftermath to this season of upheaval, uh, followed by a succession of unprecedented natural disaster. Then something happens that Kitty read about in our chapter. It talks about the fig tree casting her untimely figs. That would be Israel getting uh, coming on into notice on the world scene. And all of a sudden we see Israel and something untimely is happening to Israel. And then there's a cataclysm whose description is chillingly similar to how one would describe a nuclear weapon detonating with the heavens rolling back as a scroll and the kings of the earth, heads of state, going into hiding in their bunkers. Whatever that is, it causes the ungodly of humanity finally after centuries of iniquity to come to the fear of God because they're not just hiding from nuclear fallout. They're trying to hide from the one that they realize that it's somebody on the throne and it ain't us. Amen. There's somebody out there and it's not us. (laughs) They come to the fear of God. As they can only conclude, their only conclusion even the ungodly can make from this succession of events that something is a work that only points to the finger of God. Mm. Now, what is to be our response? Terror? Fear? No. Do we become conspiracy mongers or survivalists hoarding food and building bunkers in our backyards? Absolutely not. No way. This level of of evil, again, was in the works even during Jesus' lifetime. It came devastatingly to pass in the decades following the resurrection. And the people of God didn't run and hide. Instead, they scattered to the nations of the earth, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Let us in our day follow their example and demonstrate the triumph of God and the redemption in Christ to a world reeling in panic and crying out for answers only found. In Jesus. Would you pray to conclude our broadcast, honey? Father, thank you that the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that you are the reason we're here. You are our purpose. We're your purpose that was created before the foundation of the world. And we thank you that you've always set everything in order. And order brings glory. We thank you that we have absolutely nothing to fear in the name of Jesus because we've already been provided for. What we pray today is that many, many will be drawn by your spirit and they will get to know you before they have to face such tribulation as will come into the earth. Let today be a day of breakthrough for them. Let the spirit of God be poured out so that much loss and much death can be avoided as people come into new life in Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name today. Amen. 